Now we come to Watson. We're looking for Bram Stoker. And we find who is Bram Stoker and the wager. Hello, 17,973, 41,413, and a two-day total of 77,147. And it, I suppose, truly made it look elementary. Man versus machine. This time, Watson, the IBM computer, cream two of the best, the best Jeopardy players in history. In two games across three days, Watson earned more than the two players combined. Wow. Will Watson's win be dinner conversation for President Obama tonight? He's sitting down with top technology execs, including Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, and Eric Schmidt. The group will reportedly discuss innovation and job creation, and probably Watson. But do innovation and job creation go hand in hand, or does innovation put jobs in jeopardy? Joining us, Natalie Morris, senior editor at CNET.com, and John Rettinger, president of Techno Buffalo. John, let me start with you. Um, you know, we, we, we sit here, and there's it's, it's neat and cool to watch, and rather scary, with that little green <laughs> thing going on to watch Watson House those winners but uh, this is a broader problem uh, perhaps in our society. You know, absolutely. There's definitely a hell sense to seeing Watson out there in action. Uh, what we're witnessing right now is a, really a paradigm shift in how we interact with machines. And anytime there's a paradigm shift, it's oftentimes met with a bit of reticence. So when we saw the telegraph operator give way to cell phones uh, and different communications, um, those automations and artificial intelligence uh, ultimately opens avenues for new jobs and new employments uh, for people. So it's not necessarily robots are going to be taking uh, the job that are available, it's how humans are going to interact uh, with these new automated machines. And, and John, let's give some examples. And I, I hear your point, but I, I know that you, you've thought about this, I mean, in places where we have seen job loss as a result of technology. I understand you say, conversely, we may make up for those jobs elsewhere, uh, but let's just look at Wall Street, where a lot of our viewers are today. We've seen it there, Certainly. right? Uh, you know, we have seen it. Certainly there, there's automated trading, less people on the trading floor. There's trading software, uh, which wasn't there in the past. But there are also the people that are making the software, that are servicing the robots, that are uh, in charge of updates and maintenance. Um, so there's definitely both sides of it. We don't have the benefit of decades of hindsight yet uh, mm -hmm. to see where the new job creation is going to be. Uh, the automations that we've seen in the past have led to the employment giants Google, Microsoft, and Facebook, the companies that you just mentioned. All right, Natalie, what about you? Uh, you, you have an interesting uh, Jetsons reference on your take on this. Yeah, you know, what I, I, I thought about this about how we compare humans to machines. Now, you know, I have to hire a nanny to watch my little boy when I go to work. And that nanny has an emotional component that's very important to me. It, can a robot do what the nanny does? Yeah, sure, they could probably put Neosporin on the wounds or put an ice pack on the head when the little boy bumps his head. But uh, is it going to be able to soothe my child the way I want him to? Is it going to be able to have that emotional component? What I worry about with the lesson of Watson is something called neuroplasticity. It's where your brain changes based on the tools at hand. So mm -hmm. if you look at the way we're preventing, presenting information to our viewers, there's information below the screen, there's information above the screen. We're expecting the viewers to process all of this. We change the way we think about things because there's so many messages coming at us. There's Twitter, there's your news feed. And so we don't realize that the way that we're different from a machine is that we can synthesize. We can analyze, we can think and act and make decisions emotionally, not just based on data, which is all that Watson mm -hmm. can do. Watson won all that money and didn't say, great, J Watson Jr. can now go to college. Watson just yeah, Watson. processes <laughs> that as bits and bytes. We don't do that. So I think the yeah. lesson we can take from Watson is what our strengths are, not how we're worse than Watson. That's true. And we give Watson a name, and all of a sudden uh, he does become a little uh, anthropomorphized. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so, Natalie, what's interesting, though, is you're also saying that more automation and, and more information can make our jobs easier. What do you deal, though, with this? Um, uh, how do you deal with the issue of the fact that that means that jobs are lost? Well, like I said, I think that we should think about the jobs that we can automate and think, okay, that's something that a human once did, but there are jobs now that we can put our strengths into. What if we all went to work every day and thought, well, the reason that I'm better than a machine is because I can synthesize, I can think more profoundly, so I'm going to 
capitalize on that ability as a human. Mm -hmm. And then instead of just trying to get on an assembly line, we all thought about how we can think outside the box. I mean, wouldn't the workplace be such a better place to be? <laughs> it's an interesting point. John, what about that? You know, but some people may sure. feel, okay, first it was uh, in India. Now you've got doctors there who can look at CAT scans instead of people here. I mean, every industry in this country has not been immune to outsourcing. Now on top of it, potentially, you could have a whole nother level of, of job loss. We still haven't fully recovered from outsourcing. No, absolutely. And if I can reference back Natalie's uh, nanny reference, I think we're certainly far away from everyone having rosy, uh, you know, in our in our homes. Um, but the the technology and the artificial intelligence and the automation uh, are certainly making our lives easier. Uh, we've got the Da Vinci machine, for example, that's uh, leading to more precision surgery, uh, an increased uh, lifespan for a lot of these surgical patients. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities where this automation, this artificial intelligence, uh, is making our lives a lot better. Now, certainly, there's not going to be that emotional. Component. Component. Robots are never going to think and robots are never going to feel. But there are a lot of avenues and a lot of employment opportunities where that thinking and that rational thought isn't, nece isn't necessary. Uh, you've got human error as well. If you look at the automation at uh, a checkout when you go to the grocery store uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of opportunities for uh, automation to improve and uh, automation to help our lives. All right, Natalie, John, thanks to both. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, and let us know what you think. Have you seen examples of job-killing technology in America? Or actually, given how that segment went, let's throw Natalie's question out there at you. Would you be comfortable with a robot, you know, if there really was a good robot, a Watson-like robot, taking care of your kid while you're at work? Street Science at CNBC.com.